Hi, good morning. Can you hear me? It's so nice to see you all here today. I hope you're enjoying the breakfast. It's always a relief to see that uh, people will come at 7 a.m. on a Thursday. So I'm very happy to see you all. Um, my name is Andrea Salguero. I'm the Director of Public Affairs for the Baha'i Community of Canada. And I'm so pleased to welcome you here today to this breakfast where we have the privilege to learn from Professor Nazila Ganea, the UN Special Rapporteur on Freedom of Religion or Belief. Before we begin, I want to recognize the Algonquin people who are the traditional guardians of this land. I want to acknowledge their long-standing relationship with this territory, which remains unceded and appreciate that we're able to meet here today. I also want to take a moment to acknowledge each of you here today. Each of you have very busy schedules and made time to be present this morning. And I can really only guess at what motivated you to be here. Maybe it was the growing concern about the influence of Iran in the Middle East, or a desire to understand the increasing hatred based on religion, on freedom or belief that we see in our society. And maybe for some of you today, today's topic is personal. Maybe you've experienced a restriction to your, the ability for you to practice your faith or to live according to your deepest convictions. And it's really this last point, the ability to live and create meaning and contribute to society in a way that aligns with your principles that this event is about today. Um, today we'll hear about the situation of the Baha'is in Iran as a, as a case study. Uh, and sadly, not a unique case when we think of all the instances of uh, infringement of religious freedom around the world. As I look around the room and I see parliamentarians from different parties, honorable senators, dedicated civil servants, academics, civil society leaders in human rights, I'm so proud to see this response in Canada. And I think it's an expression of the convictions that you hold in the meaningful work that you do. So thank you for being here. In many ways, this support is a continuation of leadership Canada has always historically shown to Baha'is facing persecution in other countries. In June 1980, following the Iranian Revolution, Canada's House of Commons was the first, to pa uh, the first legislature to pass a resolution unanimously calling attention to the situation of Baha'is in Iran. Canada was also the first to create a special resettlement program for Baha'i refugees. And this program was the first dedicated effort to extend international protection to Baha'is fleeing violence in Iran. And many of the Iranian members of our diverse Canadian Baha'i community first came to Canada in the 1980s under this program, some of which are here today and I'm sure will be happy to share their experiences with you. On this note of gratitude, I want to give special thanks to our co-sponsors, senators and parliamentarians that made this breakfast possible. So thank you to Senator Mary Lou McFedrin, Senator Mobina Jaffer, and parliamentarians Elizabeth May, Terry Duguid, and Garnet Genmis, who are here today. Your support is much appreciated. I'd also like to recognize uh, Senator Yona Martin, who has joined us here today as well. Thank you. I, I would now like to invite Senator McFedder to provide introductory remarks. Oh, it has been a pleasure to say hello to most of you this morning and many of you I have also had the pleasure and honor of, of working with. Um, I'm going to ask the parliamentarians, this happens to be a good moment because Elizabeth's already standing. If I may ask the parliamentarians that are with us this morning, please to stand. I see the wonderful Ali Asasi is with us as well. Uh, Garnet, Yona, um, and I know, and of course our wonderful um, Senator Mubina Jaffer, so honored to work with you on many different issues. And I want to also add what I think each parliamentarian is thinking as they stand, which is how grateful we are to our teams to actually get us, help us get to places and get things done. Um, so, and thank you also for um, those of you who got up early and made this your priority. There are probably worth at least three other places you could have been at this time of the day. And um, in order to be here to 
here, Dakahane, it's a, it's really a, a, a special opportunity. I also want to acknowledge um, two other individuals with whom we work uh, and to, who really represent the best of the kind of evidence-based advocacy that makes change possible. Um, Professor John Packer from the University of Ottawa Law, the uh, Human Rights Research and Education Centre, and Jeff Martyr, our, our colleague with his team from Global Affairs Canada. Um, I could spend all of my two minutes recognizing many others in the room. Let me just say thank you for being here. And I think that uh, the reason we're here is to hear from Naz. She's the, <laughs> is the, uh, the short form, uh, Dr. Haneng. And uh, my, my closing comment at this introduction is simply to say, um, in many of the different events with, with a focus in different aspects of the same big issue, I think that brings us here, and that is we are seeing a regression in human rights uh, worldwide. And we are seeing a, I'm not going to say crumbling, but I am going to say attacking of the international rule of law on which more than 75 years uh, of trying to build a more peaceful, more just world depends. And in that context, the work that the UN Special Rapporteurs do um, is essential. And they are part, a very important part, and to a large extent give limitless numbers of hours of um, pro bono time to supporting the international rule of law. And um, for that, certainly I think we all need to be grateful. Um, full-time job at Oxford and full-time job in the, uh, the UN system. Um, UN Special Rapporteur, uh, Nazila Hane, please join us. We're very anxious to hear from you, and thank you for making the time to come. And thank you to Andrea and colleagues in the Baha'i community for also making this possible. Dear colleagues, good morning. Welcome. Uh, my name is Alhan Sedig Ayafor. I serve as the Director of Government Relations for the Baha'i Community of Canada. The Baha'i faith emerged in Iran in the mid 1800s with the belief that humanity is one, that women and men are equal, and that science and religion must be the twin guiding lights for the progress of an ever advancing civilization. Iran's Baha'i community is the country's largest non-Muslim religious minority. Iran is a signatory. Sorry. Okay. okay. Uh, Iran is a signatory to international human rights covenants, but it does not recognize the Baha'i faith. A 1991 policy document called for the progress and development of the Baha'is to be blocked. Baha'is are denied education and face constant sponsored hate speech, economic oppression, property confiscation, and arbitrary imprisonment. In recent months, we have observed changing tactics, new and even harsher methods adopted by the Iranian authorities to persecute Baha'is. The principal goal of these new tactics, we believe, is to sow fear and confusion, to disenfranchise and further impoverish Baha'is prolong the harassment of individuals and to infeel, instill feelings of uncertainty and thus rob all Baha'is of peace and security in their daily lives. Since October alone, over 200 incidents of persecution have occurred, including a systematic program of home invasions and arrests unfolding in cities across the country. More than 50 arrests have taken place, alarmingly Two-thirds of these detained have been women, predominantly in their 20s and 30s, highlighting an escalation in attacks against women within recent months. 
One of the most disturbing trends have been the violent and abusive treatment of the Baha'is by members of the security agencies undertaking searches and arrests, as well as the verbal and physical abuse being suffered by individuals under interrogation in detention centers. The violent raids disproportionately target women and the elderly. Now, armed agents forcibly enter Baha'i homes, ransack their belongings, confiscate their valuables. In some cases, agents have removed ceramic floor tiles, torn open furniture, and have even destroyed musical instruments. In other cases, homes have been subjected to intrusive surveillance. The installation of surveillance cameras trained on the doors of the homes of Baha'i families to monitor their activities and their visitors. Many of the raids on families with young children occurred when the children were present, intensifying fear and panic within the families. Another change in tactic we are observing is the use of legal proceedings as an instrument of fear and intimidation by the Iranian government. Currently, more than 1,200 Baha'is face ongoing legal proceedings on trumped-up charges, such as membership of the deviant sect, forming, Baha'i, forming groups with the aim of disrupting the country's security, propaganda against the regime, membership in groups with the aim of disrupting the country's security. For context, a Baha'i may be accused of any of these charges for simply trying to live a normal life when volunteering in their communities, seeking out a profession, or offering educational opportunities to their country's young people. These sentences have much at stake, as long and unjust terms can follow a conviction. This is illustrated by a recent case where a Baha'i woman received six years and eight months for providing educational services to displaced and disadvantaged Afghan children. A young woman was arrested and jailed for five years merely for making inquiries with authorities about the burial of her grandmother, separating her for the next five years from her five-year-old daughter. Another woman with two children was recently imprisoned for 10 years after spending one year in detention without trial. Those released on bail are required to post exorbitant amounts, often reaching up to 80 times the government salary, government annual salary. This places an immense financial burden on the released individuals and families, further exasperating their precarious situation. A disturbing new feature emerged in the current academic year for Baha'i students who are denied access to education, uh, tertiary education. It is now a form for students in order to recant their faith to attend university. The next trend identified as a progressive erosion of Baha'i burial rights and actions by the Iranian government attempting to seize control of Baha'i cemeteries in a number of locations across the country. Equally egregious, imagine your loved one being buried in a mass grave without your knowledge, without your consent. Khagaran is the site of the burial of between 5,000 to 80,000 political prisoners and prisoners of conscience executed by the Islamic Republic during the 1980s. Burying Baha'is in this site appears to be an attempt by the government to progressively eliminate the memory of the mass grave by replacing it with a Baha'i cemetery. Another disturbing trend is the progressive erosion of Baha'i civil rights under law, particularly with the respect to the registration and recognition of Baha'i marriages. An online registry system is being implemented for which Baha'is no, have no option of selecting their faith or other, which has serious implications for any subsequent registrations of births and any other social rights. One may ask, is this solely taking place in populous areas? State-sponsored persecution means that there is no corner of Iran where a Baha'i can live peacefully. 
Imagine farming the land in a village with other families, your family having done so for generations, and suddenly having it forcibly seized by the Iranian officials who claim the lands on behalf of the government of Iran. No compensation, no official document, nothing to justify the seizures. This took place one month ago. This is not to mention the conspicuous increase in hate speech against Baha'is. Despite this wedge that the government is trying to create, there has been a positive shift in public perception toward the Baha'is in Iran, with many recognizing them as integral members of the country's diverse society. This recognition comes as the enduring persecution faced by the Baha'i community is increasingly seen as part of the wider pattern of, effect, of oppression affecting all Iranians. Recognizing that their story is one. These examples paint a stark picture of the reality faced by the Baha'i community in Iran. This is not just persecution. It is a systematic campaign to strip individuals of their rights, their dignity, and their humanity. It is a violation of the most basic principles of justice and human decency. Yet the Baha'is have responded not with violence and outrage, but with quiet and constructive resilience. With efforts to contribute to Iranian society, as well as social and economic development projects aimed at helping their fellow Iranians. As we sit here today, tens of thousands of Baha'is in Iran are living in uncertainty. They need our voices, our solidarity, our support. Iran's Baha'i community needs the continued support from national governments and UN bodies, including declarations and statements of concern, pressure on the Iranian leadership, in order to expose the persecution of the Baha'is. Thank you for your attention. Senator McCredden, when you said that everybody here, the honourable guests, could have been at three different places, I hope one of them was at the breakfast table. <laughs> so uh, please do not hesitate to go and help yourself to more breakfast. Um, otherwise, you'll be getting quite late for your breakfast. <laughs> um, it's an honour to be with you. I was in Canada, in Ottawa, in December, uh, previous 15 months ago, um, quite early in having assumed the mandate and it's a pleasure to be able to return and be with so many um, friends, colleagues uh, that I have known over uh, many years. I've been asked to bridge from um, the, the case that Elham so poignantly d described, the situation of the Baha'is in Iran to the global picture. And I'll be going back and forth, but before do doing so, um, maybe I'll start with the personal. I think many of us are, are you know, attracted to politics or to law or fields where we're seeking to pursue justice for others because of a personal story or a, a family story. Um, I think when I look at academia in the UK, you know, many are from South Africa, uh, many are from Jewish backgrounds, many are Irish. <laughs> and uh, I don't know how that plays out in Canada, but many of us have also been attracted to this field um, because of our passion for justice and our experience, uh, whether personally or more uh, broadly intergenerationally, of injustice. Um, I was born of, uh, my parents are Iranian, um, but they had already moved to Qatar before I was born. And I grew up in, in Qatar, but we would visit Iran before the revolution. Um, but it became impossible as Baha'is to go there after the revolution. Or if I put it more accurately, of course, we could go to Iran. It's just uh, whether you are able to leave Iran subsequently. It was literally impossible because there was a religion column. Every Iranian 
anybody of uh, an Iranian father can only go with their Iranian nationality and paperwork to Iran. And to leave Iran, you had to give your religion. So even if it wasn't to be caught up in the web of the persecution in more profound and deeper ways, uh, at least legally, you wouldn't be able to leave the country. So that's when our short visits to Iran, literally a half an hour flight from Doha, uh, became impossible. Um, I didn't take discrimination with me when I moved to the UK <laughs> in the late, uh, in my late teens. There is discrimination of Baha'is that has been happening also over some decades in Qatar, but it's very different to the persecution in Iran. In Qatar, what happens, and you know, many of these friends that I grew up with whose families I know, um, every opportunity is taken to end their residency and their employment in Qatar, and they are required to leave. So literally from a community that would now be in the high thousands, it has diminished into the lower hundreds because Baha'is are obliged to exit, but in a subtle way, not in a sort of a mass displacement kind of way. Um, if I was in Egypt, I wouldn't be able to get married legally or get identity cards that are required for everything from a driving license to a bank loan. If I was in Yemen, um, you know, one may have been one of the Baha'i prisoners who remain in prison in Yemen and have been caught up in very insidious ways in an already really um, highly concerning humanitarian and war crisis. What, what becomes interesting is that in addition to all the other suffering in the world, whether it's inflation, whether it's civil war, whether it is a humanitarian crisis, how freedom of religion or belief plays out in many parts of the world is it's an additional layer of oppression. So, you know, Egyptian Baha'is don't, uh, aren't immune from the, the in spiraling inflation in that country and the situation that is arising, but in addition, they can't get married, they can't bury their dead. There's a single cemetery in the vastness of Egypt. There's a single cemetery where Baha'is can bury their dead. In Qatar, in addition to, you know, the experience of most of the Baha'is in Qatar are non-citizens because citizenship is very difficult, but some are Qataris. In addition to, you know, the experience of being a, a non-citizen in Qatar with all that that entails, there is the additional layer that every time your employment changes, your law firm closes, your um, your normal religious activities are pursued, you might there might be a court case against you, you might be refused that certificate that allows you to remain in the country. And one could go on and uh, describe exactly this situation with different religious and belief communities around the world. They are not only experiencing the daily life and challenges of others, but have this additional, totally unnecessary layer of oppression. You know, this, we can't resolve humanitarian crises and, um, you know, eradicate earthquakes. But what we can do is stop people being additionally targeted and discriminated and excluded purely because of their religion or belief. Um, when uh, in the first mandate report, what I recognized um, is something that I think many mandate holders have recognized over the years, is that we should understand freedom of religion or belief as being not only the right to have, adopt, change and manifest religion or belief as upheld in international instruments and many constitutions and uh, charters around the world, but also that there should be no violations in the name of religion or belief. What drives a violation of human rights doesn't matter. It's still a violation of human rights. And the interesting thing about freedom of religion or belief violations is not only that they are targeting people, so, so sorry, the third layer being discrimination on the basis of religion or belief. When we look at this, this um, case that uh, Enham so movingly has described, so first of all, Baha'is are being discriminated purely and simply because of their what they choose to believe, freely choose to believe. Every Baha'i child can discontinue their belief. Every Baha'i can marry somebody who isn't a Baha'i. Belonging comes from the person's own desire to continue to belong. And if you know, at any moment they choose not to believe in it anymore, they, they are free not to 
um, declare themselves or or be considered Baha'i. So it, it's absolutely an open door in every direction. So not only are they being discriminated because of their religious belonging, but also their freedom of religion or belief rights of being able to manifest freely and equally with others is being violated. And thirdly, the third dimension of freedom of religion or belief, it is being couched as a religious imperative, as a Islamic imperative in order to persecute them. So the three dimensions of freedom of religion or belief, no discrimination, no violations in the name of religion, and um, the ability to be able to freely practice. All three are simultaneously uh, being violated in the case of the Baha'is and, and many others around the world. What stands out with uh, the case of the Baha'is in Iran, which is not unique but is rather, you know, very well established um, in this case, is that it's not only state-sponsored, it's state-created, it's state-directed, it's state-perpetuated. Um, in the early years, you know, the, the case first came to the United Nations before the United Nations through the UN Subcommission, a, a subcommission that no longer exists. But in that subcommission in the early 80s, some of the subcommission expert members thought that this would, was a Marxist revolution. Um, and some therefore wanted, uh, and some thought that, well, there's revolutionary upheaval and there may be some excesses playing out. So they were ambivalent as to whether Baha'is were being targeted because of their religion or it was just part of the, the chaos that revolutions often entail. Um, but, you know, it became very clear the uh, Lebanese subcommission member um, compared it to racism, saying that, you know, whereas, whereas others are being targeted because of their skin color, this is almost the pigmentation of religion that is playing out. They are being targeted because of their, their religion. And so the subcommission resolution passed and there, then it went to the Commission on Human Rights. And for most of the last 45 years, um, there has been a UN Special Rapporteur on the human rights situation in Iran. If we look at the indicators that many academic and NGOs have regarding pre-genocide, we see that those indicators are highly pertinent also to this multi-generational experience um, of Baha'is being targeted because of their religion or belief. Uh, some UN special rapporteurs uh, started using the word cradle to grave persecution. And I think it's particularly disturbing and indicative of the depth of the prejudice and hate where the dead are being targeted. I mean, I think this has resonances for us historically. Uh, unfortunate, you know, resonates with us for very unfortunate historic reasons. But this kind of deep belief of impurity or even dishonoring the dead. I mean, the dead are no longer a threat, one would presume. But when there's this level of hatred and intolerance, even the dead or even pursuing, um, you know, the case of your, uh, your grandmother and uh, her burial or disappearance becomes a, a threat and leads to prison sentences. The intergenerational dimension, I think, is worth zooming in on one single family. Um, and often the Rahimian family stands out for me. Not, it, I think it's relevant here because one of the Rahimian brothers uh, studied in Canada. Um, the Baha'is, um, one of the first things that happened early in the Islamic revolution would, was that Baha'is were no longer allowed to study at the tertiary level. And so Baha'is created their own university. The professors couldn't teach the students couldn't study. The Baha'i faith puts a high priority on education and, and skills in order to equip us with the ability to be able to serve humanity better. And so, you know, this kind of self-help uh, university was established and developed and flourished. And so, you know, one of the Rahimian, Rahimian brothers was able to study in that university, um, obviously not accredited by the Iranian government, often raided restricted prison sentences because of being active in that university. But regardless, uh, its activities continue time and again. And so that's the opportunity um, that arose that his credentials were accepted by uh, Canadian universities and he came to study, as did 
I would assume a few hundred, I don't know the data, but a few hundred others. So the Rahimian family, Mrs. Rahimian, Afa Rahimian, um, her husband is killed for being a Baha'i. He's executed early on in the revolution. She brings up her two sons alone. Um, her two sons, one of them um, loses his wife to cancer and the other one, at, a, at some point, both husband and wife were in prison. So this now Afab, who's now a grandmother, is single-handedly bringing up the grandchildren because the son and daughter-in-law and other son who's lost, who's widowed are in prison serving the sentence. Um, her son is still in prison when she passes away um, last year. And, um, you know, uh, he doesn't get the chance to say goodbye to her. She passes away. The family decide to donate her body for scientific knowledge. The University of Tehran refuses to take her corpse for scientific purposes because she's a Baha'i. And they don't return the body, but they force it, you know, they bury it without the family's knowledge. And yeah, these are the instances that are compelling to all of us to pursue justice and counter hatred. Of course, religious persecution, which is either targeting people because of religion or humanism or atheism or non-religion, these are all on the same platform according to international human rights law. It's the, this realm of being able to choose uh, truth, belonging, matters of high conscience and importance to us. All of these are equally protected as a human right. But the targeting of people because of their religion or belief can be very overt or it can be subtle. It can be in the midst of war and conflict or it can be in peacetime. It can be um, directed by the government or the government fails to ad adequately protect those people and accept their equality. Some systems of law um, have a ranking of recognized and unrecognized. Uh, religions or beliefs. Iran being one example where the constitution in its article 13 recognizes Iranians, Jews, Christians and Zoroastrians as the only recognized uh, religious minorities. Quite clearly, uh, this was intentionally excluding many, but also the Baha'is as the largest non-Muslim community. Um, Heiner Bielefeld, a former special rapporteur on freedom of religion or belief, described the persecution of the Baha'is in Iran as one of the purest kinds of persecution. Um, and why would he say that? Uh, I think he said that is that it's quite an unencumbered targeting of people because of their religion. It's not part of the opposition. There's no historical complexity. It's not sort of also... Um, alongside claims of secession or, uh, you know, wanting to change the political order. And I think it's in that sense. I mean, I generally um, avoid any kind of um, persecution politics, <laughs> Olympics rather, <laughs> of comparing, but I can understand where he's coming from in that this is quite a simple, unencumbered, clear aspect that I think we also saw involves non it involves discrimination, it involves violation of freedom of religion and belief, but also a whole host of other human rights. Um, so if we move on to the global situation of freedom of religion or belief, I think um, we can recall that freedom of religion or belief is not the most robustly protected human right. There was over 20 years of effort between the 60s and 80s in, uh, to draft an international treaty like we have on torture, we have on civil and political rights, we have on child rights, women's rights, uh, economic, social and cultural rights, child rights, uh, and uh, the disappeared, etc. We have the body of international human rights treaties that you're all, all very familiar with. There was the intention by the UN General Assembly resolution to have a treaty on upholding freedom of religious belief. But by the 60s, uh, this had become more complex than 1948 when the Universal Declaration of Human Rights includes protection of freedom of religion or belief, including change of religion or belief in Article 18 of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. It's the time has moved on since 1967 
when the draft of the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights with its protection, the strongest treaty protection we have on uh, freedom of religion or belief is upheld in its Article 18. Now more and more countries have gained independence. The politics around this issue has shifted. And after 20 years of effort, we have the 1981 non-binding declaration on elimination of discrimination and intolerance on the basis of religious belief. As a kind of uh, second prize, third prize, uh, the mandate is created subsequent to the 1981 declaration. And there has been a special rapporteur on freedom of religious belief over the last 38 years. But it's not the same um, investment, accountability, um, and uh, you know legal obligation as would be the case if there was a treaty on it. So therefore, it falls on the shoulders of champions, legislators, politicians, uh, lawyers like yourselves to share the burden, to carry the burden of an area of human rights that is only increasing in its violation all around the world um, and whose international mechanisms are not as robust as other areas of human rights. So also, it's not separable from other areas of human rights. Give me one instance of persecution uh, on grounds of religion or belief that is singular, you know, only singular in targeting freedom of religion or belief. It's never the case. It's often with, you know, people are targeted because of their religion or belief, but then they suffer economic, social, cultural, civil, political violations. They then suffer extrajudicial killings. They are then imprisoned. They don't have due process. They don't have equality before the law. They then are, don't have equal access to education, to employment, to freedom of movement, to social security, to health, and one could go on, right? So freedom of religion or belief is one of the many human rights. And when people are being targeted because of their religion or belief, invariably a whole a host of other human rights are also being violated at the same time. The victim may, may be um, feeling it only in terms of their religion, and they can feel that that's why they're being targeted. But the human rights that are, as a consequence, being trampled on and violated are, are numerous. I think freedom of religion or belief is also an area where it's really important, and uh, at least I, I seek to, um, uphold in an impartial and inclusive way. So, you know, uh, one is sometimes personally bemused um, and, in, you know, finds oneself in an interesting situation. There was an allegation letter not so many months ago that related to a community where the religion was founded in 1999. And, you know, part, uh, you know, on a personal level, I thought, huh, I never thought I would come across a religion that was, uh, you know, created in my 30s, but how, how interesting. And of course, um, the case uh, is as, you know, as valid and important as uh, a religion that may have been founded 6,000 years ago or 10,000 years ago. It makes absolutely no difference. Um, it's the fact that uh, they are being targeted because of religious belief that makes it unacceptable and a legal violation of international human rights law. So we've said that the inclusivity of freedom of religion or belief means it stands and falls alongside so many other rights and that it needs to be upheld for everybody on an equal and impartial basis. Um, my uh, colleague and, and the former special rapporteur, Professor Ahmad Shahid, would uh, talk in a number of his reports about right-sizing religion. And uh, I think when we're championing freedom of religion or belief, it's also important to situate the religious aspect and the freedom of religion or belief aspect within the broader context where the violations are occurring. That doesn't mean diminishing it, is, it is, but recognizing that, you know, in this case, do I highlight land rights? Do I highlight educational rights? Do I um, highlight um, the religious prejudice that is driving it or the religious nationalist political party that is increasing the, the challenge for this community. So, you know, um, that's, that is always quite an interesting part of uh, navigating freedom of religion or belief. But the fact that I know that a political force is driving it should not diminish, um, you know, our resolve to champion the rights of those people. We might understand the political overtones or undertones, but it should make no difference. I mean, the fact that we have trade interests, 
that we have political interests, that, are, that there are other interests that are implicated, might make a difference to how we champion uh, the rights of people because of their religious or belief, but it should never silence us. And we need to always be mindful of that and not sort of trade um, human rights with other interests or highlight, uh, you know, the persecution of one group above another. Um, it sounds simple, but actually it's quite challenging and one needs to always step back and orient oneself um, on that. Um, freedom of religion belief is often also politicized. We choose the community that we we will champion and sometimes we will then give less voice to another community. There are political parties that have a particular affiliation with those of a particular background. So I mean, I think these are all realities, but they are realities that can be, you know, live alongside the fact that we will be impartial and principled in upholding freedom of religion or belief. Otherwise, we are feeding into a fragmentation of international human rights law that will be counterproductive for all of us in the long term. Um, I'm very proud, I don't know why I'm proud, but I'm very proud of the fact that Canada has been able to maintain uh, a focus on freedom of religion or belief in its human rights work through different um, electoral uh, results uh, over the years. The UK, uh, I know that many colleagues, um, not I mean, I'm not in the political field, but uh, we know many people that are also preparing the ground for a cross-party, continued cross-party support, regardless of outcomes of elections this year. And I, I find it very moving that even political actors and parliamentarians are investing in freedom of religion or belief commitment um, and uh, preparing, you know, other actors to step in um, in case their their party um, is not the one that succeeds in the next election. I, I find it a very sort of perhaps one of the most selfless things <laughs> one can expect in the political arena for this greater cause that is human rights and freedom of religion or belief for all. And we see that unfolding in, in many contexts. Canada is active in the International Contact Group on Freedom of Religion or Belief, which is a network of, of states committed to freedom of religion or belief. It's active in IRFPA, another network. Um, it's been um, central to the evolution of a, um, a coalition, coalition is the wrong word, but a, a network of parliamentarians, the International Panel of Parliamentarians on Freedom of Religion or Belief. And um, there's now, I had the good fortune of introducing the this panel of parliamentarians on freedom of religion or belief to the interparliamentary union last year. So hopefully it will also, you know, play out against that broader um, context of parliamentarians working across many uh, areas and thematic priorities, including freedom of religion or belief. Let me just end by saying that uh, the responsibility to impartially and in a principled manner uphold freedom of religion or belief uh, becomes a shared responsibility much more even than other areas of human rights concern because of, it, because of its weaker structural protection at the international level. I'm hugely grateful for the opportunity to uh, collaborate with Canadian colleagues from civil society to, to the state level. And um, perhaps I can hear more from you and we can have more of an interaction in the 12 or so minutes that remain. Thank you. Please, I'm be most curious of where your minds are at on, on uh, these and related issues. Thank you very much for being here and thank you to my colleagues for hosting this event. Uh, I want to go beyond uh, the persecution and discrimination you described in the Middle East and ask you to cast your eye to India, where there is, if not state-sponsored, persecution of the Muslims in India. It is definitely state tolerated. And I would like to know whether you are engaged in that issue and what you can tell us. Thank you. And this is uh, Senator Ratna Obinbar. Sorry. Thank you, Senator Obinbar. Shall we take a few or one at a time? Okay. Thank you. 
Hi, uh, Gerda Genesta, we Parliament. Thank you so much for being here for your work on various uh, challenging situations around the world. I wanted to ask uh, for your reflections uh, on a on a Forb issue here in Canada. Every Western country, uh, every country around the world deals with instances of violence uh, or vandalism targeting places of worship. Uh, we've had a lot of uh, discourse here in Canada around concern about uh, uh, rising anti-Semitism, rising Islamophobia. Uh, but strikingly, to me, one of the things that gets almost no discussion is a kind of spate of, of acts of uh, vandalism or destruction targeting Christian churches. And this, um, this emerged following a lot of discussion about the history of church involvement in, um, in some historical uh, abuses that happened here. Uh, nonetheless, when, when somebody attacks a religious place, if their justification is something that happened in the past, we still don't tolerate that. We still acknowledge that as a, as a violation of, uh, of, religion, of, of freedom of religion or belief. And um, I'm trying to make sense of the fact that there's almost no discussion at the public political level around this. I don't know if, if international bodies are following the, uh, the targeting of churches that we've seen in Canada in particular uh, and, and what the response is and how, how, uh, how that's being engaged. Thanks. We'll take one more question. Thank you very much. Uh, welcome, uh, Madam Special Rapporteur. That has a nice ring. <laughs> up here, Professor. Um, then, uh, my name is John Packer. I'm a professor here at the University of Ottawa. Um, I'm struck by, I did not know about the cross-party initiative in the UK. I think that's laudable, and I hope that those uh, parliamentarians here are listening. I think that needs to be done more. But I'm concerned at the civil society level. There's a lot of um, particularism, I would say. Uh, increasing advocacy of my group, my religion, sometimes implicitly in opposition to others. And this is linked, I believe, with polarization, which is a really uh, poisonous aspect of infecting all of our side design and the world. Um, do, do you have some thoughts about how th th there really needs to be some... Uh, well, what are your thoughts on that? <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. If I take them in reverse order, uh, just... It's easier on the mind. Um, you know, navigating polarization is one of the biggest challenges and one that you're left alone uh, with uh, to, to struggle <laughs> as, uh, as an independent um, expert. Um, so you need to understand the politics in order to speak appropriately. But the role is not a political role. I am, I am not seeking to politicize an issue uh, as a special rapporteur. Of course, politicians, legislators can politicize an issue, and that's how they they do their work, right? But so, but the polarization is really suffocating, uh, and it, the the politics of it uh, is considered by many, including in UN Human Rights Fora, as the the main priority, and it's so alienating. I mean, I'm not completely naive, but nevertheless, <laughs> one works in human rights law and. Uh, uh, seeks to serve it in order for it to be for everybody. So I, I agree with you. I think individual experiences can be the portal to inclusivity. Um, and I, I know many instances of many of the freedom of religion belief champions and working actively and inclusively in this arena. It was the experience of, you know, their father was a missionary and then this, or they, they were they suffered uh, discrimination or bullying at school, etc. So I think it's absolutely fine to be driven to an area, but then once you champion it, it, it is absolutely for, for everybody. Um, my report next month to the Human Rights Council is on advocacy of hatred, and that's what we're discussing tomorrow at the University of Ottawa, but it's on advocacy of hatred based on religion or belief. And the obsession, sorry, this is kind of, some of it is, <laughs> I'm, I'm feeling comfortable here. But the obsession in the United Nations is what is incitement. And you think, okay, of course, I mean, in other areas, we are really, really concerned about what is genocide. Of course, that legally matters. But that doesn't mean we should only be concerned when it's genocide or incitement. We should be concerned about every instance of hatred. We should be concerned about every episode that shows intolerance because that is where you react in order to prevent effectively. And so I start with saying, start with talking about how hatred is a major concern and we have obligations to eradicating 
intolerance and hatred at the lowest level, at a singular instance of it, at the grassroots, that is where we are equipped and indeed obliged to act in order for us not to need to have the discussion about incitement or genocide. So um, I, I think sometimes we are only concerned about the highest crimes and, and violations, and sometimes we're only concerned about a single community, or we say, well, yes, they're suffering, but what the whataboutism? Human rights law doesn't tolerate whataboutism. I, I mean, both are legitimate, or all three or all 50 are legitimate human rights concerns in and of themselves. So sorry, that was a bit of a rant. Um, at the international level, um, the targeting of places of worship is a concern. Of course, it's a concern of uh, cultural rights. It is a. It can be a um, instances of um, you know lack of protection of the security of the person. Uh, it is a minority rights concern because uh, people belonging to minorities should be able to enjoy their own culture, their own religion, etc. So, I mean, of course, it's not enjoy enjoyment when you're under siege and uh, there's this deep sense and legitimate sense of insecurity. Um, and of course, with indigenous peoples, that also plays out in particular ways. So it is a debate at the international level. Um, it is an inclusive debate at the international level. But if I talk simply about the mandate, we need um, allegation letters is what they're called, but we need communications to come from the national level to the mandate for the mandate to be able to pursue it. And um, I would encourage every state to think about this as an opportunity to address an issue. So, you know, if an allegation letter comes from the rapporteur, let's say about churches in Canada, which I had not heard about until today, um, this is an opportunity for the Canadian authorities to respond to it. So, you know, what we say is that we have heard reports of such and such, should these be confirmed, these are the rights that would be violated and the obligations of Canada that, um, you know, are at risk. And please respond to us. These letters, these communications are confidential for 60 days. And um, there are some rare instances where the state uses this as an opportunity to address an issue. And sometimes we know that there are ministerial uh, jockeying, right? So it gives... Uh, the different uh, ministries a better opportunity to speak to one another and address issues that might be cross portfolios, etc. So it should be welcomed, but of course, uh, sometimes states are very concerned about these letters that are forthcoming. But hopefully civil society can write to us and it can be an opportunity to open the debate on this issue. All countries have violations of freedom of religion or belief. It, uh, they are not equivalent and, you know, a surveilling state that is intentionally targeting different groups or eradicating or disappearing is not the same as one where it's uh, primarily at the societal level, but one may have concerns that the authorities are not acting sufficiently. My um, two uh, country missions to date have been, since my appointment, have been to Tajikistan and Sweden. They are not equivalent in the investment of um, controlling or impacting the sphere of freedom or religious belief, yet all have recommendations. Both of them have recommendations for improvements in the state concerned. Um, regarding India, there have been many um, allegation letters. There is one that is pending. It is a deep concern, especially uh, I put in my report on the advocacy of hatred that the times of elections are a time of great risk and often great risk for religion, uh, various religions and beliefs within uh, countries, and that certainly plays out in India as well. Um, India does not allow visits. You know, the country missions can only happen with the permission of the state. But um, I'm even thinking of going to other countries where the influence of the, the movement that the Indian government is now driven by plays out in other contexts. So, you know, one does the best one can, but I'm often in contact with civil society actors. They were active in the Earth Summit. There was a very uh, good panel last month in DC on this issue. And I totally agree with you. It's an area that has, it is intentionally polarized and there's intentional silencing uh, going on there, but we need to be able to address it. I, I have, you know, we even see it playing out now at um, the legal level, you know. so. When, when a country is not dealing adequately with freedom of religion or belief, it may initially come from one arm of government,
but over time it filters through the different protection mechanisms of a government and becomes more and more concerning. My report to the General Assembly last last um, October was about the domestication of freedom of religion or belief. We need all the actors in a government, national level, state level, provincial level, local level, to really be responding and upholding freedom of religion or belief, otherwise it becomes meaningless. So be very happy to talk to you more about it, but it's a major area of concern where access is restricted. We have time for one more question. Thank you very much. My name is Lindsay Morgeris. I work with Global Affairs Canada. Uh, it's been a fascinating discussion this morning, and I wonder if I could bring it back to um, the Baha'i community and just uh, inquire, and I know we only have a few minutes left, so this might be a long question uh, or a long answer, but what more can we do to support the Baha'i community to ensure, uh, not necessarily ensure, but to advocate uh, more strongly for uh, respect for their um, freedom of religion and belief, uh, particularly in Iran, but of course elsewhere in the region, as you have noted already this morning. Thank you. My report to the Human Rights Council last year was about actions and routes and mechanisms for upholding freedom of religion or belief, and they're at every level. So when, you know, um, I have never come across a victim of human rights violations in Iran that has said that international attention or attention to their case was counterproductive for them. It, it, you know, it may be that it doesn't help some victims of human rights, but that would have happened anyway. The fact that there is the limelight shed on it can only be a positive thing. Um, so we need to raise it, uh, and we need to raise it more because there's a less robust international machinery, and the international machinery is often really, um, there's a straight jacket of particularisms and polarization around this issue. It's politicized to an extent that it might be extinguished, right? So every opportunity, Networks of parliamentarians, a single parliamentarian and senator as a tweet. In a private closed door meeting with Iranian actors or public, it, with uh, any kind of interactions, every opportunity needs to be taken to draw attention because this is the lifeblood of the victim and of an increasing persecution on a community. Of course, it plays out regarding other cases as well. It's the cases that are not addressed, that are traded off for trade and other interests that are the ones that keep growing. Um, we all know about the global situation now. Um, whilst Iranian civil society is increasingly feeling that it has become a common experience from having been a particular experience of, you know, you know, Kurds, Baluch, political opponents, the left, uh, the outspoken, the star student who asked a question from being isolated um, experiences. Uh, I don't know if uh, you would ex agree with me, but I, I hope you're hearing it also from your constituents and others, that uh, the Iranians are connecting with the fact that they are all suffering to a greater or lesser extent and that everybody's human right ultimately is at risk. Everybody, even if you're uh, the, the daughter of um, the previous uh, person who was meant to become the supreme leader. You know, it goes that high and it goes across many different uh, segments of society. So people are feeling it at one, but at the international level, we are not conveying it as one. We are still seeing them as isolated uh, targets of uh, human rights violations. And we also see, um, again, I'm not a political actor, but we, we are all hearing reports about Iran's more regional role. Um, and I think this is a lesson for all of us that if one group is, um, if a, a state is rewarded with um, its targeting of one community or one group being ignored, then it will spread. And if we think that the, um, the role of the government in the neighboring countries is uh, overlooked, or there isn't a response to it, it will spread beyond and impact us. So that's why I think human rights are universal, is that 
ultimately we are all victims of violations of human rights, whether we see it in the short term or longer term. We should speak out. We should speak out with principle. We should speak out in whatever means and routes that we find are most effective, but boldly, courageously and inclusively. Thank you. After your speech, Nazlin, Nance, um, it's very really hard to say anything because I'm still thinking of uh, what you said and also what Abraham said. But these are not new things. Right? These are not new things. Uh, I've been involved in this issue for ever since I was a child. My father raised me in Uganda. We went to the temple, and he always used to tell me about the persecutions of the Baha'is. So it's it's. It's a long time, and one of the things you were asking, if I may say so, is to raise awareness in Canada of the issue, uh, which would be really important because many of us are not aware. I, I am supposed to thank you, so I won't speak, except to say, I hope you'll come again. We have so much to learn from you, and even then, we also get to hear of issues in our own country when we come to hear from you. So. So it's a, it's a pleasure to have you here. You raised our, uh, you've said so many different things that I'm still, still uh, uh, trying to say what, what, which one I, you know, how do I deal with it? So I made lots of notes when I go. So I appreciate you being here, giving your time. And please see Canada as your home. Come again and come again and come again and see us as partners. I can genuinely tell you when you look around this room, it's not this full normally. This is showing a lot of interest. I didn't expect so many people to be here. And so I, it just shows people in our country, parliamentarians are thirsty to learn from you. So please come again. And thank you also for your remarks. Uh, I, I would be I would be remiss if I didn't leave one talk with you all uh, before I stopped, and that is to t let me tell you of a story of a young woman called Sim Saberi. She was born in Iran. After graduating high school, she went to work in an agricultural corporation. On 14th October, she was arrested because she was a Baha'i. The Iranian regime then proceeded for her execution eight months following her entry. Her arrest. Sadly, this is not a one tragedy, and you heard of many, many others. And as you leave this room, appreciate what was said here, but appreciate that, especially I'm speaking to the parliamentarians, we have a lot of work to do together. And so we assure you we will work together on this issue and other issues of religious freedom. And I thank you once again for being here. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Jaffer, Professor Ganyan, and thank you to all of you for coming this morning. Uh, that concludes the presentation for today. There's still food, and we have the room until 9.30, so feel free to go for seconds or to mingle and chat. Um, and have a good rest of the day.